If you've ever felt sick or noticed some symptoms that might concern you, trying to self-diagnose could be a problem. And joining, joining us now is Dr. Stacy Valander with Stanford Healthcare. Thanks for coming on this morning. Always good to see you. Okay, so first, what is self-diagnosis? Self-diagnosis is the form of identifying disease in oneself. This can be informed by reading medical information. Usually people find this on the internet. Of course, we know that. We Google. Exactly. <laughs> we know that not everything we read on the internet is true. Uh, and so this can lead to an extreme form of self-diagnosis where there's not actually a disease there, which is hypochondria. And so it's not a good thing when people do this. Yeah, it really is a problem mm -hmm. because of that, because it could lead to... Yeah, so there's so when you think about it, a medical professional has thousands of patient experiences to draw on, the medical literature that the lay person doesn't necessarily have access to, and we also have our colleagues, whereas a patient may only have their experience, maybe their family's experience. So we're really coming from two completely different places as far as the information that we're drawing on. So the medical professional is much more likely to get to the, the right diagnosis diagnosis, patients can run up against three problems, what I call the unconcerned sick. So these are patients who actually underdiagnose themselves. So they tell themselves, oh, it's just a headache or it's a stomach condition, when there is actually true disease there. And so these are some of the worst tragedies we see in healthcare because a lot of times these patients come in too late to actually receive medical treatment that could have maybe changed the course of their disease. The second group is what I call the worried well. These are the hypochondriacs that I just mentioned. Um, these are the people that are losing sleep, losing productivity, overthinking that a disease uh, is there that's not actually there. I actually just saw a young patient last week who was brought in by her parents who were, ha they were having conversations. She was worried that she had cancer. And I even remember feeling, you know, similar, having similar thoughts going through medical school. We had a conversation, we talked about, you know, the data, what was there, and we made a plan that she would monitor her symptoms over time. I think she was very reassured. So, you know, those conversations are very valuable. And the, the third reason, uh, the trouble that patients can run into is when they actually mislead the, the clinician in terms of a diagnosis. So when we're thinking of a diagnosis, we, we like a blank slate and then we like all of the information. We like to think of all the diagnoses it sure. could be. But if you have a patient saying, no, this is it, this is it, and they're pushing you, they could be pushing you in the wrong direction. Of course, sometimes they're right and that's, that's good. I, I love when that happens. Um, but you want to also think about all the other things as well. So you don't want to mislead your doctor. Sure. Is self-diagnosis, is it always bad? Can it ever be good? You know, it can be good. Uh, so actually, if you think about it, the entire over-the-counter medication industry is based on the premise that uh, patients or people can diagnose their own ailments. Yeah. So things like headache, menstrual cramps, common colds. Uh, people are, they can make those diagnoses, go out, buy those medications, and, and treat themselves. And that's perfectly appropriate. Okay, so of course we've been talking a lot about coronavirus. Uh, in fact, all morning long today we've been talking about it. Um, what about self-diagnosis in the context of the coronavirus? Yes, so the coronavirus situation is rapidly changing all the time. We think that it's uh, about two to five times uh, the mortality rate as influenza, though even that number is changing. The data out of China suggests the most common symptoms are cough, fever, and lower respiratory uh, symptoms. And so people that have just simply a common cold, some of the data out of Washington State that we're seeing is that those people are less likely to have the coronavirus. Uh, but really the take home point is if you're concerned, if you're sick, stay home, no question. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you need medical treatment or medical opinion, call your clinic first. We're getting people out of the clinics, we're trying not to expose them to other patients, other medical personnel, and we're getting them on to telemedicine appointments. Mm -hmm. And if they need more medical treatment at that time, they will get further instructions. Okay, so then how can we protect ourselves? So, yes. So, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Wash your hands and don't touch your face. And then I've also been telling people, when you get home, consider uh, washing your clothing, because that clothing has been out in the world touching different things. Um, of course, if you're sick, stay home. We're telling everybody that, even if you just have a common cold. The situation is evolving. We're, we're really trying to get a handle on it. We're really trying to understand what's going on as a medical community. I saw an interesting tweet the other day, and it said, when washing your hands sounds like a new idea, there's an issue. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I know it's a good, you know, it's it's a good reminder. Yes. Yes, good hygiene. All right. Thank you so much. Always Thank good to so see much. you.
episode. Yes. And remember, every Monday right here on CBSN Bay Area, we have tips and advice from Stanford Healthcare. So tune in next week for a new topic. Still ahead.